The following content is provided by MIT OpenCourseWare under a Creative Commons license. Additional information about our license and MIT OpenCourseWare in general is available at ocw.mit.edu. Okay, well, welcome tonight. A very special lecture for me tonight. Um, in more ways than I can express. This is the last of my lectures, but I look forward to uh, your lectures coming up. I really do. I've heard from the TFs and from what I've seen from talking to many of you, this is going to be a really amazing set of projects this year, more than any other year. Anyway, last week we asked, what can biology do for computing? And this week is going to be a little less nuts and bolts than usual. The, the entire course, as you all understand, you're all self-selected to like survey courses, or at least this one, because you're still here. And tonight's going to be more of a survey than ever before, and it's going to be talking about topics for which we don't have answers. And uh, for, the, for the most part, there'll be some interesting details along the way. Um, but anyway, instead of what computing can biology can do for computing, this is more about what biology and computing can do for the world. That's really what we want to do. And also, sort of the higher level network models that we can build, since this is network number three. So we'll start out, we've been talking mainly about cellular models as our highest level of networking, and so we'll talk about multicellular models. In particular, the sign of multicellular models that you get that involve uh, sensory integration, integration of higher levels. And then, uh, and then, mul then uh, multi-organ, all the way up to multi-organ systems, where we'll take an example, sort of from the atomic scale all the way up to uh, organ system failure, and then, uh, and then we'll go from there. Okay. So let's start with multicellular models, and uh, this is something that I, that I, I'll, I'll show you a few slides that will remind you of the first lecture. They either were taken from the first lecture, or in this case, this is a wildly different author and approach and so forth, but it's the same lesson as from the first lecture, which is we not only have these exponential curves going from the 1900s, but they're super exponential. They go up from the trend lines you get depend on which set of points you use, the steepest one being the most recent one, 1995. And it's basically as part of when it is that we will have computing power that might be on the order of an integrated human neural net. We talked about neural nets last time kind of as a metaphor or as a, an algorithm, but when will we actually have a computer that has the capability of the human um, cerebral cortex or entire integrated nervous system? And the basis of those calculations that Moravec made, and, and in lecture one, Kurzweil was the ex super exponential curve that I showed. Moravec made them based on his studies on how the retina works. And uh, I think those of you who have done a lot of computer programming, uh, that understanding how uh, the retina works is probably one of the more intuitive of our various human senses. Uh, in the sense that you can kind of program an algorithm that might do in the lower right of slide four here, edge or motion detection. You know, when a, fr a frog sees a fly, black and white, go high contrast, zoom across his visual field, something goes off. And you could write an al uh, algorithm that could do that, given a few frames of, uh, of any kind of form. So anyway, but, but there's, there's been quite a uh, literature on this subject. And when you go through even the best algorithms right now for doing these kind of calculations, and you figure out how long it takes uh, to do... Um, the retina is doing about 10 million detections per second, and, uh, and then you scale up from that 0.02 gram chunk of retina up to uh, the 1,500 gram human brain, then you, then you kind of get the extrapolation that was in the previous slide. I think this is interesting both as an introduction to the kind of algorithms we'd like to think about when we think about integrating a multicellular system, but also in terms of where the compute power um, both biological and computational is going. Do we want to 
engineer biological systems to keep up with the, compu the silicon or whatever other computational system we're using uh, a decade or so from now. Now, so I said that the, the visual system is a relatively intuitive computational system to program. In contrast, I would say the olfactory system is less intuitive, at least for me. We know now quite a bit about the molecular biology of the system. There are a thousand receptors. It's probably one of the largest classes of genomic repeated proteins. And these receptors are in the same family as the receptors that are the major class of drug receptors, the G-protein coupled receptors. And there is basically one receptor per cell, which is quite a trick, right? Because you got one receptor from mom and one from dad, and you've got uh, thousands of receptors. But there's basically one per cell. And they, and they detect uh, olfactory uh, molecule concentrations uh, over about seven logs, um, where the concentration thresh, where, where they can detect uh, uh, a concentration threshold with a particular standard deviation. Now, this is, this is the beginnings of the model. It's just stating the facts that you know about it. You've got, when you look at the neuroanatomy, you've got uh, this, uh, the odorant molecules down at the very bottom of this figure, um, uh, cilia, olfactory neurons, which is the primary uh, signal transduction. This then goes up where it's integrated um, in the glomeruli. And you can think of this sort of like the neural nets we were talking about last time, where you had these uh, interneurons, you had the, the, the uh, extra layer that we showed was so important. And the thing that's amazing about the system are, are lodged in these four basic olfactory facts, which I take from Hopfield's uh, work, uh, which is really just like this is the same Hopfield that uh, introduced us to neuron, or really champion the concept of neural nets as a computational algorithmic metaphor. And here, the idea is you have odor and memory recognition. You have background elimination, as just like uh, you know, how your eyes adapt to a mostly red room, your, your nose is great, your, your whole olfactory system is great at adapting to uh, background uh, odorants. So you have one known and one unknown thoroughly mixed. Number three, you can have component separation. You can have a, a few different odors at once. You have odor uh, separation where you have um, uh, unknowns. And each of these tasks, uh, I mean, uh, the combination of these is quite remarkable. So the, the basis of the model that Hopfield has proposed and uh, uh, is, is this. You have uh, a coverage for each of the eye receptors, where eye goes from one to a thousand. This will vary depending on the organism. Mice have twice as many as we do, probably, so on. But the coverage of each, the, of, each of those receptors um, is equal to the minimum coverage um, uh, for, for the uh, concentration of the target, where the, say the target is the target odorant that you're looking for, uh, over the uh, concentration that's the threshold for firing that neuron for that target, threshold in T. Then you multiply that times either one or some fraction. It's one if you really hit the target, um, and it's uh, this fraction of, for the, that particular receptor and that particular target, you've got some crosstalk. And the amount of crosstalk, uh, you can think of this as a, as a field of receptors, which are all uh, um, have variable binding. And that binding is over these seven, six or seven logs here. Um, and that's, this just reflects that same thing that we were talking about. And then, so, that, so the, the, the total uh, number of inputs going to the next layer in the neural net, the coverage here, is going to be the sum of this of this target signal plus the background signal. So the first term is target and the right-hand term is the background. And as you can see, they have the same form, the same threshold and concentration, C sub B is concentration of the background. And then 
Uh, okay. Now, so let's see how this plays out when you actually uh, try this out in a olfactory processing problem. Here you have an odor space, and uh, what, what you have here is 80 different neurons is the y-axis at the top of uh, slide 7. And then across the bottom, uh, uh, sorry, across uh, the x-axis is time in milliseconds going from 0 to 800 milliseconds. And this is all uh, modeled on, on fairly realistic parameters based on experiments. Uh, and so what you have here is 80 adapting neurons, and what you're doing is two sniffs of a mixed odor. That's what this is modeling, okay? Uh, first, you have a 100 to 500 milliseconds, uh, the, the, the range from, so you, so you have, you can see that something's happening at 100 milliseconds, and up to 500, you have a mixed odor, which is 50 parts of X plus 1,000 parts of Y, or 1,000 times uh, Y. And, uh, and then at 500 milliseconds, you change this, this ratio very slightly. You see, you just uh, up x by 75 and y up to from 1,000 to 1,100. Okay. So that's the paradigm. 50 and 1,000 to 75 and, and 1,100. And then sniff at 100 milliseconds, that, that, that first one, that mixed odor. Um, it activates more than half the neurons. So this is not like your retina, where if you have a single point source, it will activate that one uh, rod cell, or maybe a center surround uh, sort of effect. But it's really activating half of the neurons, okay? And then the change sniff at 500 milliseconds, remember just these two small changes, is almost invisible, right? So that's what you're seeing uh, right here, okay? Is this this huge this huge swamping amount, but then in in B so that, that so that's what happened in A B you've you've now uh, plotting instead of individual neurons you're doing the instantaneous rate in Hertz okay and now uh, uh, when you could you can see the six, second sniff here as the as the, at the 500 milliseconds which even though you really can't see it in the corresponding point where you're looking at all these individual neurons. And uh, so you can see that a, even a 20% spread in, the, in one of these parameters is enough to, uh, to get this kind of uh, easily detectable signal. Now that's the example of a simulation. That's not a simulation of a particular experimental data set, but it's based on experimental data sets. And the code, this is not Mathematica, this is MATLAB, which we, all, which we could have interchangeably taught in this course. And you can see here in green are the comments, and you can see some of the things that we've been talking about here. Uh, the, the, uh, the number of receptor types is actually here, 2,000 instead of 1,000. You can see the, 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 the target, remember I said, could be some random number that, that goes over six logarithms. Well, the way that's done here is here's the random number generated, and... Uh, and, and you, you generate as the log of the target, and then you get the target by taking the exponential. It's very straightforward, and the code goes on from there. Okay. Now, this brings us to a very interesting point. Um, since these three lectures on networks, and in a certain sense the whole course, is building towards systems biology network models. And for these models to be useful, in the same sense that the models we had for X-ray crystallography and the models we've had for for genome interpretation in terms of homology and, and sequence um, folding and so forth, needed to be shared. It's the, mo the models, even more than the data, need to be shareable because, in a certain sense, uh, even the modest manipulation of the data involves some, usually involves some good model behind it. And so these are some of the work groups that are working on uh, different modeling schemes. In particular, I should point out the the BioSpice is now DARPA BioSpice, and SBML is kind of a growing part of that system biology markup language as a way of sharing this data. And as yet, there's not the kind of convention that we have in uh, crystallography and DNA sequencing where you submit, at the time that you publish a paper, you submit your data and model 
data slash model with an accession number to the database or else you don't get it published. We're nowhere near that now for the rest of biology. But these kind of efforts probably are moving in that direction. And you can see that, that the features of each of these uh, are some of the things that we've been talking about before. You've got stochastic modeling, kin uh, kinetic modeling, enzyme receptor, um, sort of cell geometry, um, neural nets, and so on. This is by no means comprehensive, and there are hypertext links here if you really want to dig into them. And some of the platforms that they've been thinking about different, uh, different ways of making it slightly less system dependent. Everyone has you know, their attempts. Obviously, Windows is not system independent. OK, so that's two very brief examples of multicellular models, uh, both of them being uh, neural models kind of building from what we were thinking about last time. But now we're going to a completely different kind of multicellular model all the way up from sort of individual effects that a single nucleotide, how much effect a single nucleotide can have on a whole organ system, uh, which in this case will be cardiovascular. So we go from... And uh, there are a number of physiome and cardiome projects uh, that are uh, of active interest. These, uh, just like the previous slides that I showed showing all the ways of sharing system models, many of these efforts uh, are kind of loose consortium alliances where people have uh, put together different models, either deal with the uh, anatomy, physiology, or sometimes a, a, a uh, integration of uh, molecular to cellular, cellular to um, say neural or muscular, and all the way up to um, fluid dynamics and so on. So let's start with a single base pair change. And uh, I start with this one because you should feel comfortable with it at this point. We mentioned it briefly before. Uh, we'll talk about it in more detail now. This is the single nucleotide polymorphism which causes the change um, of the beta subunit of hemoglobin, which is a tetramer, to go um, from a glutamate, normally in most people, at position 6 of the beta chain to a valine. Or, so that's the, the purple uh, set of tetramers, or to tryptophan, and that's the cyan <coughs> set on the far right. And uh, this from combinations of X-ray crystallography and three-dimensional modeling, and this is not speculation, just based on primary sequence data, even though the primary sequence here is very, very close, just a, a single nucleotide, a single amino acid change. Nevertheless, these authors have been building this from uh, the crystallographic data, where not only do you care about the, the tetramer itself, but how the tetramers interact with one another to make these long fibrous chains, which are uh, considerably more stable uh, in the sickle cell. And what you see here is uh, sort of an, uh, the, uh, the valine substitution is uh, locked in one kind of conformation and the tryptophan in another. And you can see how uh, these authors have, have decided how a potential fiber can form. Um, in the different cases. Okay. Now those fibers, in one way or another, which is not totally mapped out, but you uh, eff affect the efficiency of, uh, of the hemoglobin slightly and the, and the shape of the cell much more radically. And this combination uh, results in the, in, the, in the cell, especially under any kind of stress, either oxidative or other metabolic stress, becoming sickled. So you can have a, a, a combination of cells which have varying degrees of sickling here in, uh, in this, um, this uh, microscopic slide on the left. You have both the sickle cell and the normal cell side by side. I think when we built up the red blood cell metabolic model, we talked about some of the non-metabolic considerations of that, which were that, it, uh, you know, this function is to transport oxygen and so forth. And the 
what we're talking about now is more a cell membrane uh, issue. It's on slide 13, where the internal environment, uh, which is the hemoglobin, is greatly affecting now the external environment, which is the hemodynamic flow in the in the in the uh, capillaries. Okay. So this falls under the heading it now of how is it that we can go from that single nucleotide change to a very dramatic morphological change. In this case, it's pathological, but you could imagine that in the hands of evolutionary adaptation, uh, an organism could take this and run with it. Maybe not sickle cell mutation, but some other one that causes some other morphological change in some other cell or complex aggregate of cells. Because here you can see a whole variety of different um, uh, shapes of, of, of uh, red blood cells. And remember, these red blood cells are very simple. They have no um, macromolecular system, no DNA, no RNA. So we're really just talking about a bag of proteins which are greatly affected by these different um, conditions or enzyme deficiencies. So the system models that were built up where we had the uh, kinetic parameters for the, for the enzyme here can, can, in principle, be modeled on their the impact it would have on the, on the uh, osmolarity or the other membrane properties that were listed in the previous slide, or the sick link that was in two slides back. Okay. Um, okay. So, from a single uh, nucleotide polymorphism, we've gone to this three dimensional fiber of uh, hemoglobin to a, three, a change in the three-dimensional structure of this biconcave uh, disc um, to a sickle disc. But you can also go sort of in parallel, the same single nucleotide polymorphism or some like it can, can take you up to pathogen resistance. We've already mentioned that, that sickle cell hemoglobin can take you to uh, malarial resistance. But in addition, uh, you can get uh, components of the enzymatic metabolic pathway, such as the one that we modeled uh, two lectures back, such as glutathione prostatase. This is part of the uh, redox components. And here, uh, erythrocytes that, have, that are heterozygous for this, per this particular allele um, should be more efficient in sheltering the cell membrane from irreversible oxidation and binding hemoglobin caused by the oxidant stress that's exerted by um, the malarial parasite. And what they observe here is actually an interaction between the, these two possible uh, haplotypes. So it's, not, so it's actually, you can think of it as a pair of haplotypes. It's the one is... Uh, the hemoglobin AS, the one we've been talking about, the sickling, and then this glutathione peroxidase. And so what you can imagine is that since both of these things interact with malaria parasite, that, that your genotype will depend, I'm sorry, your, your phenotype with respect to malaria will depend on your, the alleles that you have at both cases. And so you can here you can have an A over S heterozygote and a 2 over 1 heterozygote. And so that's something to take into account when you're trying to do any kind of uh, predictive modeling or ex modeling it to explain the uh, functional genomics that you have in a patient who's a compound heterozygote like that. So now with the third pathway from now from single nu same set of single nucleotide polymorphisms that affect either hemoglobin or one of the major enzymes in the red blood cell. Now uh, you know one to cell morphology, one to uh, pathogen interaction, and finally to interaction with drugs. We talked about pharmacogenomics. Here's another example um, where you have the drug-induced oxidative hemo hemolysis that you occur with certain hemo hemo enzyme opathies like uh, glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. Um, this, these, this enzyme, uh, glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase, interacts with drugs such as uh, primaquin, and uh, it disrupts... Um, mitochondrial function, heme biosynthesis, and so forth and so on. Uh, this is a, a very significant uh, consideration when the, with a long list of 20-some drugs 
that ha has to be taken into account when you have uh, any of a variety of, of um, red blood cell enzyme changes. So we've got these three effects of a limited number of single nucleotide polymorphisms. How do you make this transition from, uh, and they're all somewhat interconnected. Part of the reason it's resistant to malaria is because it's less effective in its cell shape and its ability to transport uh, oxygen and uh, do its metabolism. And same thing with drug uh, sensitivity. How, how are these uh, changes in the, in the hemoglobin um, might they be reflected in the three-dimensional shape of the uh, erythrocyte, which is a kind of a membrane-bound compartment. And here's a model that, that struck me as interesting. It's not, it's, uh, been, not been that extensively tested since 1998. But the idea is that band three, this is uh, one of those names that just comes out of the, the molecular biologist literature, that they run a gel and they count the bands and number three. And it turns out it's... Uh, it's, the, it's about 10% of, uh, of the red blood cell membrane. It's a very abundant protein. And, um, and it's responsible for the uh, equilibration of anions, such as carbonate and chloride, across the red blood cell membrane. It's not a pump that just kind of uh, allows these uh, anions to go across, because the pump here is the pumps that are involved in proton, and, uh, and there's also uh, sodium potassium. And that's what your ATP in the red blood cell is going for. And this, these are just kind of following along. Now you can, the idea here is that uh, if you can, if you change the uh, degree, let's see, I think this is covered in more detail. Uh, no, sorry. This, the, uh, the mechanism of action here is greatly affected by its disulfide uh, effects. If you change the, the redox uh, components in the red blood cell, then you get a slight ch just a slight change in conformation of this molecule, and then that can result in a net difference between this, the cross-sectional area of this protein on the outside and the inside, which translates into a net change since, since the phospholipids don't uh, exchange uh, they, the, or the rate constant for the phospholipid exchange is slow and known, uh, then this results in a, uh, in a uh, uh, conformational change. Anyway, that's the model. That connects the single nucleotide to, could connect it to the, the three-dimensional structure of the cell. Then you want to connect the three-dimensional structure of the cell to uh, its ability to carry out its function in the capillaries and function there is to uh, allow the fusion of, of uh, oxygen and uh, carbon dioxide. And so um, so here, the, each of these cells is shaped by a mechanical process. And the mechanical process here, you can take the known uh, uh, or the measurable mechanical properties of a red blood cell and subject them to a uh, method called finite elements uh, analysis where, you're, where you're, you're solving these uh, partial differential equations. And, look, and you can calculate the uh, exchange of the, uh, the oxygen, uh, the, uh, Alveolar just refers to, this would be in, in the lungs, this would be a small capillary in the lungs. And you can see the capillary now in the epithelial walls are close enough so that the red blood cells are basically uh, deformed in their shape as they go through there. And the exact shapes that are compatible with this will determine the rate of these little arrows that go from the oxygen on the outside and the lung uh, epithelium get through to the red blood cells. So that's, uh, you know, a reference uh, that, that deals with that kind of problem. Now, once, as we start thinking about building up a larger system model, the other parts of the system, each of them, so we've got a red blood cell model, it's a metabolic model. In principle, it could also be a shape model and a diffusion model. But the other parts of the, of the system typically involve 
uh, 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 muscle cells. They have the, 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 the smooth muscles uh, throughout the entire um, um, arterial and venous system, and, and most significantly, the, the heart muscles. And so, here you have an example of an action potential in, a, in, in one of the ventricular cells of the, of the dog heart, and it, it includes all the components that, that, at least we, since this is not an entire course on, uh, on uh, ventricular uh, heart modeling, uh, it, this, this is for sort of parameters in terms of all the eyes, the currents for each of the different potassium channels, the K, all of each of the ones that I for K uh, is all potassium. And then there's some that are sodium and sodium and calcium, calcium, potassium, sodium alone. You see each of these things. You have internal stores of calcium that go from one subcellular compartment to another and 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 so on. You get the idea. Each of these things has to have the parameters measured and uh, any of that are absent, you have to uh, have reasonable ways of getting uh, surrogates. And so this is the sort, this is just the sort of data that would go into the other major type of cell that, in, that comes into this cardiovascular um, modeling. And finally, you can integrate this uh, up to a, a fairly complete system obviously not complete until you get to the whole organism, but higher level, and we're, how we're talking about whole body recirculation. Uh, this NSR group, uh, this is the hypertext link for this particular model, um, which you can download, and it has a four-chambered heart. We were just talking about one ventricular cell in the previous slide, but that would be, um, if you look at the second box from the top here, this is the, where the heart and lung uh, model would fit in there. Got seven different organs, which include kidney, liver, gut, lower limbs, and so forth. Down at the bottom part of the diagram, and you get the picture. Each of these things, you, you're, mod you're modeling the, the volumes and flows. Okay. Now, this is systems biology. This is really uh, kind of a renaissance of interest in physiology, is what it would have been called before. And there are some really interesting. Um, mysteries out there to be solved that are really only solvable, at, or possibly only solvable at the system level. You know, you never know, you, somebody could come up and say, oh yeah, this is, this is really well understood uh, immunology and that answers everything. But even if it's some kind of immunology, or um, you still have to say, how does it play out? And what happens is, we've been talking about sickle cell disease, and you can have fairly mild pain as one of the major symptoms. Um, but then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, you'll get this multi-organ system failure where uh, you know, almost every major organ in that previous slide, lungs, and so forth, fill up with fluid, and, uh, and you uh, have a very high chance of dying. And this can happen to every one of us in this room because it's not restricted to sickle cell. If any of you have severe uh, burn or, or car crash, uh, major bone injury, so forth, you have a very good chance of getting this multi-organ system failure. And it really isn't known how that plays out. I mean, not even that, not just a quantitative model, but uh, even uh, qualitatively. So I think this is something, there are projects now to do, to get genomic data collection, both genetic and um, expression data, and time will tell whether that is uh, actually a the best route to, to solving that mystery. So that was multi-organ. Now we're talking about multi-organism. Okay. After you've built up an entire organism, uh, then you want to know how it acts at the next level of network analysis, which is um, how does it fit in with other organisms? None of us, n almost no organism, really belongs in an ecological niche all by itself. And uh, some, some of the modeling we've been talking about in this course could be called simulation. And uh, probably one of the longest lasting uh, uh, computer games in the world, and one of the most uh, successful, I've, I've heard, is the, the, the uh, Sims. 
started with Sim City in uh, no Sim City in '87, and uh, and then this particular one illustrated here is Sim Life, which is all about ecolo ecological modeling, and it's not entirely different from what uh, you know a serious uh, ecological modeling program would do. It certainly has a lot of the interesting parameters, such as uh, the lifespan here, you know, you're doing demographics here, so you have the lifespan, uh, you know, food needed, uh, uh, the size, kind of vision, roaming, so forth, of all these different different kinds of animals. You can have uh, uh, herb uh, you can have plants, you can have herbivores, carnivores, and so on. And then you can set up the population sizes, and then it will do simulations uh, based on that, where each each individual animal is uh, tracked in terms of its uh, position and quantity, and and, uh, and as you would expect, as the you know carnivores build up, and they knock down the herbivores, and the plants go up, and and so forth, and it goes through these cycles. Um, and so this is basically a stochastic model, just like the stochastic models that we had for um, for molecules, but here at the organism level. And what's happening here in this lower right-hand section is you've got little green plants uh, getting eaten by herbivores and the herbivores getting eaten by carnivores. Now, hopefully this course has already or will inspire you to, to really think globally, to think not only globally in terms of uh, how little pieces of molecular tools fit together into systems and networks, but how our systems and networks we model fit into the big picture of what's, what are really important problems. Uh, you know, maybe a slightly improved uh, Viagra is not in the same category as a new tuberculosis drug, or maybe it is. I mean, you decide for yourself what is thinking globally but you have to act locally, and that's what we're doing in this class. Um, when we're thinking globally and we're thinking about ecological systems, we're thinking about the lithosphere, for the most part, uh, and its interaction with uh, the hydrosphere. The uh, lithosphere is mostly silicon dioxide, a uh, tiny bit of carbon, um, and it gets very hot very quickly. So um, only the top 0.1%, the top four kilometers of it, is uh, survivable in any type of organism we know of. About 110 degrees centigrade is where organisms start having uh, deep deal trouble. You and I would have trouble before that. Um, uh, the biosphere. Uh, here is about uh, 3 times 15 grams. Uh, and my estimate uh, for uh, uh, marine organisms, and maybe 10 to the uh, 18th gram for uh, all land plants and animals and uh, microorganisms. Uh, the microbial hydrosphere uh, here is about uh, 10 to the 21st. 20, 10, 21st uh, milliliters, which works out about 10 to 27 cells. A phenomenal number of these cells, about 10 to the 26 of those cells, is a single species, which is Prochlorococcus, which is responsible for um, maybe about 50% of your photosynthesis. Um, a lot of that photosynthesis is, does not end up in fixed carbon because it, uh, it is immediately consumed by one of its other uh, 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 predators, basically, um, but there's a you know there's really quite a lot of uh, uh, cells out there, which to the extent that they're well mixed and they're not, of course, it's not perfectly mixed all the Pacific and Atlantic and so forth, but it's it's a considerably more well mixed say than the lithosphere organisms where you have organisms down uh, a kilometer into the ground they don't move around very rapidly. So when you have a population that size, as you remember from our, one of our first lectures on population size, the effect of population size determines the, the rate of drift and the sort of the, the, the uh, op optimality of the organism. 
So one of the things that we do when we, we've been talking about mining the biosphere, one of the things we're looking for are new tools that we can use for, um, for nanoengineering. And one of the one, or kind of one of my pet ones that I'm um, becoming interested in, we don't work on this thing, but this is kind of interesting, is, uh, is a set of, we mentioned this briefly in the, in the drug uh, protein interaction lecture, where, uh, but I don't think I mentioned this particular one, where you have uh, polyketides that go together, it's kind of a, po it's another polymer that has certain similarities to the basic polymers we talked about, but each step in it had to have a protein enzyme um, an enzymatic domain to accomplish that. And so one of these is tetracycline, and this is one of the more aromatic, you know, kind of coupled aromatic compounds that's made, uh, because you have these cyclases and aromatases in addition to the sort of pol polymerization steps. And so you make this thing that's, uh, it looks kind of like a poly uh, aromatic hydrocarbon. And, and also in nature you will find in soot, in forest fires, and all kinds of natural phenomena, you will find polycyclic hydro uh, aromatic hydrocarbons, which some of you may know about as being a potent carcinogen, but they're also just, you know, natural components. And, but they're also, th you can start to see this looks a little bit like the bucky balls and bucky tubes that we talked about when we were talking about molecular uh, type transistors. So the possibility of mining the biosphere for these for enzymes that act to synthesize or degrade the class of compounds, I think, be just an example. We could list many others, but the, the part of it is just to dream, to imagine what it is you would like to find out there, and if there's an abundant source of it, um, then then uh, you should be able to abundant source of, say, the compound in this case, then you should be able to find a, a microorganism and an enzyme that goes with that, because there's a, a truly phenomenal amount of Diversity. The other ask, the other, another very important global consideration, rather than just mining it for new tools, is thinking about ways that either we could engineer or accidentally mess up uh, our entire planet, um, as we are could be doing with global warming, or could do. Uh, and perhaps it's naive to think that we actually are having such a big effect because we know that global warming changes periodically over um, millennia. Uh, but it is, it is very clear from the record that, that just exactly how much carbon dioxide we are releasing, and it makes sense uh, that it's consistent with the kind of temperature changes that have been observed since the Industrial Revolution. In any case, when you look at uh, uh, in particular, the southern ocean, uh, up at the top of slide 27, you can see there's a few places. In particular, the southern ocean seems like it's a prime candidate where you have high nutrients but low chlorophyll. And you say, well, why would you have high nutrients but very little uh, you know, of the chlorophyll around, uh, that you would, which, would, which is uh, a tip-off that you have uh, the photosynthetic bacteria? And the reason is that you have... Uh, limitation of some micronutrient. Micronutrient means it's not needed in uh, you know, the vast quantities that you need, nitrogen, phosphorus, carbon, oxygen, and so on. So iron typically is the limiting micronutrient in the Southern Ocean. And so there are actually uh, have been little pilot experiments to drop iron off uh, the backs of uh, huge tankers, and there are now s at least seven patents that have been filed on doing this in order to balance out uh, carbon credits for different nations. This is potentially a very big bit of terrestrial engineering that might happen that involves trying to uh, change uh, phytoplankton. And as this line here begins to point out, even though phytoplankton are only 1% of the total global biomass, it's about 50% of the carbon fixation. What is the source of this 50-fold anomaly? Why is it that even though it's doing, uh, you know, how is it doing 50% of the carbon fixation? And what's happening is a lot of the carbon is going right back out uh, uh, after being fixed instead of settling to the bottom of the ocean and never bothering us again, uh, uh, it, it gets um, returned. And the exact modeling of that requires a much deeper knowledge of exactly what organisms are present in the ocean. One of the problems with this, however, is a genomic 
problem in a certain sense, uh, which is that very few of these organisms uh, can be cultivated in a laboratory. On the order of 99.9 percent of the organisms that you sample from the ocean or from the soil, a number of different environments, uh, do not grow well in the laboratory. So if you were to study them, um, some people are feeling that the best route to studying them is going directly for um, looking at their genomes without necessarily being able to grow them in the laboratory. Now, when we talk about this, this problem of even if we fertilize the oceans and, uh, and you know, we can model this whole procedure, we'll go into details, but uh, if there are predators there that, that take the fixed carbon and turn it back into carbon dioxide, you want to be able to, to monitor that. Now, of course, the ocean is a large, complex uh, set of prokaryotic um, autotrophs, that is, say, photosynthetic bacteria, and eukaryotic photosynthetic bacteria, and prokaryotic and eukaryotic uh, predators um, of various sorts. And this is, I think, one of the more interesting predator-prey um, uh, differential equation models. It's, very, it's almost the same as many of the other differential equations that we did uh, from, gr from the first lecture on, on uh, growth. We did the logistic equation, some of the ones we did on repressor function and so on. But the thing that's kind of interesting about this one is it's not s simply a, uh, a uh, single cell bacteria being eaten by a single cell heterotroph, single, you know, let's say a blue green algae being eaten by a single cell heterotroph. Here you, they're both multicellular. Uh, they're sort of the minimal multicellular, but they, because they're both, so chlorella is one of the smallest plants, multicellular plants, and um, uh, Brachionis is a ro small rotifer. Uh, uh, multicellular animal. Because they're multicellular, though, now you have the demographic mortality uh, and fecundity of each of these things that has to be modeled in. That's the, the M and the lambda for Brachionis. Um, and so uh, this plays into these equations where you have here the, in the upper uh, right, slide 28, the, the rate of change of uh, uh, nitrogen with respect to time and uh, concentration of chlorella. So nitrogen is N, chlorella is C. Um, the uh, R is the brachionis and uh, uh, of, that are reproducing, and B are the brachionis, which are uh, the total. And you can see each of these equations and how it plays out. Now this is how, uh, and the way they play it out here is you do it by uh, dilution rate delta here. And the dilution rate um, is shown along the, uh, the, the horizontal x-axis for each of these three plots here. And what they're modeling uh, is uh, on the far left, the nitrogen concentration uh, uh, as a function of dilution rate. And you can see you get these different uh, 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 different sectors of, of behavior. When you look at the chlorella, this is the green, uh, the, the photosynthetic multicellular organism in uh, units of millions of cells per milliliter. That can take different, uh, th there's a, it can take different pa pathways here, um, where as a function of dilution rate, you get this bifurcation where you get a, a huge uh, split in the, in the possible uh, concentrations of Chlorella uh, is the one curve, and the Brachionis um, the predator is the other curve. It's kind of bifurcation is the sort of thing we talked about uh, earlier in, the, in the, both in the logistic equation and uh, in the, um, in the uh, cell decision uh, modeling. And, and what in the upper right hand, you're, here's our from the coefficient of variation in percent, ranging from 0 to 8, 80 or so on the vertical axis, and the dilution rate. And again, you can see um, that you get a peak in the dilution rate at around 0.75. So these are, these are the, the bottom two are models, and the upper right is, a, is data. 
Um, but you can actually see when you run real chlorella and brachionicin here, that you do get a peak, just as you would predict this kind of bifurcation now in the kinetic modeling um, that's due to um, where, where you get um, interesting behavior in this complicated, or this fairly simple model ecosystem where you just have two species. In the ocean, of course, you have a lot more. Now, that's out in the wide world where you have 10 to the 26 cells. But inside every one of us in this room, no offense, but there are about uh, 10 times as many non-human cells in each of us as there are human cells. And we have our own ecology. And there is a literature where, you know, certain organisms we know cause diseases and they're put into one category, infectious diseases. But then there's another set that takes some time to sort out. And you can see here are candidate diseases and candidate organisms. And all these little bars that are going in here are, uh, you know, references that you can look up where uh, maybe it's not an airtight case yet, or maybe it's not even, maybe there's controversial or, or discredited at this point. But these are links where eventually this will be called an infectious disease. You look at bacteria, how do I cause the stomach ulcers? I think that's basically already accepted. Uh, I, uh, some Australian doctor named Marshall decided to drink a bunch of helicobacter to prove to his colleagues. He didn't believe any stomach ulcers were caused by helicobacter, much less all of them. And uh, he drank it, he threw himself, he drank it again. Uh, and he caused stomach ulcers. Uh, in himself, and uh, and hopefully um, none of you will volunteer to do similar things with some of these other uh, nasty guys here, because I think some of the list of things that they cause are a little more serious than stomach ulcers, and the cures are a little less obvious than the cures for a gram-negative bacterium like Helicobacter. Um, there have been various efforts started uh, to actually mine, you know, what's the connection with uh, genomics and computational biology, to mine the transcriptome uh, for evidence of these. You can look for bacteria very easily because they have ribosomal RNA uh, components, uh, which you can PCR. Viruses are more complicated because they're not conserved, uh, or they don't have any universally conserved uh, element like ribosomal RNA. But there have been efforts to take, uh, look for what's present in the human transcriptome that's not present in the human genome. The human genome is something, you know, highly purified and uh, cloned and so forth, while well, the transcriptome is, uh, you know, it's whatever cells they grind, ground up that day. And, they, and, and indeed, lurking in there are many of these uh, hepatitis, papilloma, Epstein Barr virus, um, retroviral-like elements, which are not present in the human genome as yet. The human genome is not completely finished, so that's still a, a escape clause, but basically uh, these are smoking guns for at least commensals. Microorganisms and viruses that are living in tissues, and some of them may be tissue-specific. Some of them subset may actually cause disease, and that's the whole problem, then, is sorting out cause and effect. We know how to how it's been done heroically with Helicobacter pylori, but how do we do it with the other ones? Some of them will have tissue culture models. Um, at the time this slide was done, so, so this is just uh, illustrating kind of the flow of uh, nucleic acid information that comes in about uh, the, you know, it was capable of being mined for new microorganisms, new viruses that might be present in a tissue-specific fashion, might be pathogens. Uh, this is some of the most popular sequences that are from which we're mining, obviously, uh, human um, uh, was popular at the time it was done because the human genome was in place. Here's Brachionis, our friend, which was pretty high up on this list, considering most of you probably didn't hear about Brachionis before this lecture, now you've heard it twice. Uh, it just was a expert in uh, sequencing interest. And of course, HIV is the winner year after year because of the importance of resequencing it for, um, for new mutations. And it really has a record number of new mutations. And we've talked about HIV uh, from different, for a variety of different standpoints. Uh, one of them, you know, is polymerase. It's 
its protease as drug targets and as a uh, source of drug resistance. And that you can follow up that, that model, you know, that sort of atomic scale protein modeling where you're looking for new drugs that won't, where the uh, polymerase, the mutant polymerase will not be resistant to new drugs. But you can also monitor to the population scale as HIV goes to a particular patient or to a population of patients, how does the um, drug resistance change as a function of time? Here the horizontal axis is in days up to 30 days, and then the vertical axis um, is the um, uh, uh, the, the titers of the viruses uh, um, and you can see as a function of time. And what you have here is um, um, uh, rates of exponential increase. These are all these are on uh, logarithmic scales, and uh, where you're modeling such thing is the uh, clearance to the immune system and so forth. Originally, this virus was thought to be a very slow virus, very slowly replicating virus, um, uh, almost cryptic. And then later it was found out this is actually a very rapidly replicating, but an immune system that's very rapidly responding. The sort of model, just each of these models we've gone through has a set of parameters that, that goes along with it. In a certain sense, there's quite a bit you can learn about a model just by seeing what parameters are present or absent, whether they're experimentally determined, how accurately, and so on. And sort of model parameters here are the mortality rate of uninfected CD4 plus T cells, same thing for infected cells. You know, they're going to have differential mortality. You can see on the far right that there's a huge difference between uh, the guy at uh, point uh, quarter per day versus uh, by thousands, and so on. There's rates for um, getting infected, rates of virus loss, production, um, uh, uh, threshold value for remission, so on and so forth. And these are important uh, parameters for how the virus population changes within a person or within a population. How it spreads through the population depends on, uh, in many cases, on the, the herd immunity and so forth. And we get into issues of public health. It's almost a truism that, that, that most of the uh, additional quality years of life, uh, quality adjusted life years here, Q-A-L-Y, that we have in the world, the fact that you know our life expectancy is so much longer and so forth, are mainly public health uh, decisions that have been made, not so much pharmaceutical. Um, such things as uh, clean water um, have made a huge impact. And so we need to think, but even when you think about the pharmaceutical aspects, it needs to be thought in a public health sense. And a surprising amount of public health officials in even the most developed nations, maybe most of them aren't, do not have formal education in public health. And so I urge you all to get at least some education in this. Because in this we have, you know, here, they're trying to build and have built quantitative models, not only for the, the kinetics, which a disease will go through a population or through even through an individual, um, but, but the way that you m make decisions. And this is having an impact on the way decisions are, how these different uh, projects are prioritized. At any given time, you might have hundreds of different uh, candidate vaccines, um, which is one of the, uh, a major, very effective uh, public health strategy. Um, and this is the way they prioritize it. So that level one saves money and it improves life. So that's almost a no-brainer. Uh, and then you have different levels where you have, uh, might cost uh, $10,000 or $100,000 per quality adjusted life year to save. Um, and uh, so the level one candidates are cytomegalovirus and uh, therapeutic vaccines, which include, these are not aimed at an infectious disease, but diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis, uh, various bacterial ones. 
Of course, HIV was not even in the study because it was such a high pri priority already um, within the NIH. Okay. So is there a role for genomic and computational biology, the title of this course, in this vaccine research and development? I think the answer is yes, but it requires a great deal of creativity and resourcefulness on, on all of your parts. Uh, there are new opportunities with DNA vaccines that, where you can have one or more DNAs uh, shot uh, intramuscularly or a variety of other uh, ways. What is delivered by the DNA vaccine can be uh, various so-called intracellular vaccines, um, which can either act through cell-mediated immunity or in some other way intracellularly. Uh, RNAi is a, is a rapidly uh, emerging uh, way of uh, delivering things uh, that wouldn't, may not be classically considered uh, therapeutics or vaccines. Um, the concept of multiplexing, you admit many uh, of us or our, uh, uh, have received m multiple vaccines at a time. Typically, every year your flu vaccine will have two or three strains in it. But um, as you can see from this uh, middle article, the diversity of certain diseases like HIV and influenza almost demand uh, attention from genomics, the diversity that can occur either from year to year or throughout the entire um, global uh, uh, set of viruses. Another opportunity is when we have um, vectors, or say uh, um, arthropod vectors, insect vectors like mosquito, and we have uh, uh, opportunities to, and to hit malaria at all the different life stages. Not just, there are multiple life stages within humans and multiple stages within, uh, within the insect vector. Um, and now the genomics of these two just came out recently um, in the uh, same week in Nature and Science. This provides a whole new set of uh, inspirations for work that can be done on these. I think we should take a little break now and uh, we'll wrap up the talk after that break.